So um, what I, was, I was saying that, uh, so the type of work that I do in my lab is, is really at the interface of uh, computer science, statistical modeling, algorithm development, and, and data analysis. And, and all with a view of uh, furthering our understanding of, uh, of cancer disease types, um, processes governing tumor evolution, um, and essentially how the genome is remodeled from when in the transition from normal cells to, to neoplastic cells. And so, so really all of this activity is, is, is directed at understanding questions uh, on this side of the equation. And so uh, you've met Gavin, and uh, Gavin's going to be uh, featured uh, quite a bit in this this particular lecture, uh, he's done a lot of the work that I'm going to present. So, uh, so, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge his uh, invaluable contribution to uh, some of the work that I'm going to show. So, what we're going to go through today, um, uh, and it's it's a, it's quite a long list, and um, I hope we're going to get to it all. We may not get to it all, but um, but these are really the. Uh, the, the major topics in, in copy number analysis that I, I was um, hoping to cover today. And, um, and, and so we'll discuss uh, a little bit about the biological relevance of this type of analysis uh, and, and its impact, how we might measure copy number changes, um, the different technologies, and, and how to handle that data uh, from arrays through to sequencing data. And then at the end, we'll get into some, uh, some more advanced topics that um, have really come into, uh, into light through recent discoveries in the literature in the last year or two. So this is a picture of uh, a normal karyotype. It's a spectral karyogram. And it shows uh, how DNA in our cells is essentially arranged into 23 pairs of chromosomes. You have one set from your mother, one set from your father. And, and, and so essentially all the genetic material is tightly packed and nicely arranged into this, uh, into this arrangement of, of 23 pairs of, of chromosomes. And essentially there are 22 autosomes and the sex chromosome. So this is, uh, by definition, a female, two X chromosomes. And if there was a male, there would be one X and one Y. Okay. So the properties that govern the transformation of a normal cell to a, a cell that's, that's undergone um, uncontrolled growth. Um, the, the role of the genome in that has been um, suspected for almost 100 years. And, uh, and so, so Bo Bovary and his experiments with sea urchins noticed that um, some of the cells that started to grow on, on, uncontrolled and on, in, with uncontrolled uh, proliferation uh, had, were aneuploid in some chromosomes, so some, they had an extra copy of one of the chromosomes. So he suspected long ago that um, that must have something to do with, uh, with the acquisition of a phenotype of uncontrolled growth. And so he described these observations of multipolar mitoses in the sea urchins and, and, they and that led him to believe that uh, abnormal distributions of chromosomes and cells were the culprit behind uh, the initiation of malignancies. And it wasn't until uh, about 50 years later that he was proven correct with the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome in, in, in chronic myelogenous leukemia. And this was uh, discovered by, uh, by Noel and Hungerford and published in Science in 1960. So this was the first real example that chromosomes, abnormal chromosomes, or the abnormal organization of genetic material in the cell is actually responsible for uh, a malignancy. So this uh, has been shown now um, to be a property of nearly all cancer cells. Not all, but ne nearly all. Um, and this, this is, in, in some diseases, it's particularly uh, pronounced. And um, so in high-grade serous ovarian cancers, which you'll probably hear a bit more tomorrow from, uh, from David Huntsman, who's giving a talk, I think, uh, is that tomorrow? Yeah. Um, so he, he runs the Ovarian Cancer Research Program at uh, the BC Cancer Agency in Vancouver. Um, but this, this shows that another spectral karyogram of, of different, um, of what the organization of genetic material looks like in different tumor cells. These are extracted from different patients. Um, and so you can see that there are uh, 
there are genome-wide duplications, so, so there, in, in some cases the whole genome is, is copied. Um, there are exchanges of genetic material between chromosomes, um, and that's shown by where you have a hybrid chromosome that's colored with two different colors. That means that the, the origin has come from two different chromosomes. Um, and you have loss of genetic material, and you have gains of genetic material. And so these genomes are essentially um, unrecognizable now. They've been just, the deck has been completely reshuffled and, and scrambled. Okay, so, so let's look at that in detail and, uh, and see what the consequences of that. So, um, so, so copy number variations, or you might, you might uh, hear the term copy number aberrations or uh, copy number alterations. Um, they're all the same thing, and they mean that uh, there is a loss or gain of genetic material. And so, uh, so, so t by way of example, so here we have uh, a copy number uh, of this particular locus that has, it has three copies, um, and here you have a loss of, of, a, of a region, and then here you have, uh, this is actually from a germline perspective, where you have actually a de novo uh, gain of, of, of material, and then so sometimes you have deletion followed by duplication, and we'll get into all these different scenarios. So to look at what this looks like in a, in, in a tumor type, what's shown here is, uh, is arrayed across the x-axis is essentially the genomic locations um, and organized by chromosomes. So this is um, essentially putting the genome onto uh, one linear uh, chain. I'm losing my pointer here. Um, and, and what's shown on the y-axis here is the frequency in the population of that particular locus being gained in red. Uh, or deleted in blue. And you can see that nearly the whole genome in a, in a large breast cancer population is affected in, in, in at least uh, at some, low free, some level of frequency. And, uh, and so, so this is a, a prominent um, feature of the genomic landscape of, of tumors. And so, so it's very important to consider. This is a, this is a thousand. This is, well, 997. So, so this is the frequency in the population of this region of the of the genome being uh, having extra copies there. So it's a it's a, a copy number gain. So, so nearly half of all the breast cancer patients um, will have a uh, gain of of eight Q. So this is the the Q arm and this is the P arm here, and then nearly nearly half have loss of eight P. Okay. That make sense. So, the reason why this is important is that copy number alterations disrupt normal cellular behavior. So, you can imagine schematically, um, we have, uh, let's say, we have a region of the chromosome that harbors three different genes, and um, you can have different mechanisms that lead to copy number changes. So, so here's the deletion. So, it, you may observe in the the wild type in the normal cells. Uh, you would have genes A, and A, B, and C in this particular locus. Uh, in tumor cells, you may have a deletion, and uh, and so that would be that would be manifest by that this locus just basically not harboring uh, the gene gene the B gene here at all. Okay, and then you could have uh, uh, one gene might be copied many many times, and um, and so that would result in something that looks like this. Or you could have the whole region could be segmentally duplicated. So you could have this whole region um, be copied over twice. So in the previous slide, the number is measured by genes? In this particular slide, uh, yes. So, so this each, um, each data point is a gene. Uh, but you could easily um, do it by genomic location as well. Yeah. So, so what that looks like is... Um, so let's say we have, uh, uh, in, in our in normal cells, we have this segment here, A, B, and we have C, D. An amplification you, res, results in extra copies of that, and deletion would re, re, result in, in removal of that particular, um, particular locus. And, and so copy number alterations are segments of a chromosome, and this is, um, and this is a really loose definition of approximately 1 kb. Um, we use that in the field just because it's, um, it, it's become a standard uh, definition. Regions that, structural variations that are, that are smaller than that, which you probably already heard about, um, are considered uh, insertions or deletions. 
um, at the sequence level. But, um, but really, that's an arbitrary definition. But essentially, what it means is that um, you have a region where genetic material is lost or gained. There are hallmark of tumor genomes, as I said. And, and so you can imagine that uh, CNAs can lead to adverse expression changes of targeted genes. This is because of a gene dosage effect. So, so this becomes particularly important when, uh, for example, if you have uh, an oncogene that's, that's harbored within here, and its role in, in the function of the cell is to promote growth, uh, then extra copies of that will lead to a growth type of phenotype. Or if you have a tumor suppressor, that's contained within a deletion region, and that material is lost, and that protein never gets expressed, and so uh, that f the role of that uh, that gene to be a guardian of of growth um, or a suppressor of growth is 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 removed, and and the, the cell can achieve uh, a growth-based phenotype. Yes. What would happen in the cases where the reverse happens, right, where the tumor suppressor gene is amplified? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, maybe the cell wouldn't be viable. Yeah, so, so it, the, the cells may never, never be selected for. Yeah. So, um, so, so really, these are um, many studies are now uh, published and, and are ongoing to, to find copy number alterations for diagnostics, prognostics, uh, gene disease associations, and, and targets for therapeutics. So, I thought I'd just go over. Um, Types of CNVs that you may encounter. So, uh, so how many people work on um, on congenital disorders in the room? Autism. No, no, but, but I know. But, okay, just thought I'd probe the room. Um, so, so you know, certainly in Toronto, this is a this is an active um, an active area. Um, you would have heard these are. Um, these are abnormalities that um, that are that people are born with. A classic example is trisomy 21 um, in Down syndrome, um, and and uh, mental retardation or, or cognitive disorders have been associated with CNBs. Um, somatic alterations, uh, which is what we're really focused on in this workshop. Yes. I don't understand the question. What is the real difference between CNA and CNB? So so I'm just about to say that. Okay, so so these are these are um, variations that people are born with. These are acquired in the lineage-specific um, development of, of of the cell. So so as it um, transforms from a normal cell to a neoplastic cell, um, then it's only specific to, cancer. to cancer. That's right. It's, uh, it's, I actually, I don't work on cancer. I work on uh, stem cell. Industry, stem cell. Okay. Mm -hmm. and yeah. There was an issue with the call of called the CMB. Yeah, so, so in the literature you may see CNBs refer to um, both uh, this in terms of pathogenic um, mutations, but also in terms of just normal human variation um, that makes two people different. Um, they're, they're a large percentage of, of the genome is actually subject to, to copy number variation that has um, essentially no uh, deleterious uh, phenotypic effect. It just makes two people different. Um, and these are, are cancer specific, so these would be not found in the normal cells by definition, um, and these are really acquired uh, and would be specific to the cancer tissues. Um, and, and as I said, most, if not all, cancers harbor uh, some form of somatic uh, CNA alterations. Um, and then what, the, what I was referring to earlier, essentially benign variations. These are um, these are polymorphisms that are naturally occurring in the human population, and um, and the 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 point mutation uh, analog to this is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So uh, so, so that that um, things like the HapMap project, the Thousand Genome Project, um, are all are all designed at. At trying to understand this um, from a from a basic human variation point of view. So, in terms of uh, in terms of alterations in cancer, um, we have several different types of alterations that that are that could be considered copy number changes. Um, the first is is segmental aneuploidies, and these are these are often large scales. They would they would contain a, a large percentage of a chromosome, for example, a chromosome arm. Um, the, the structure of chromosomes is such is that 
um, sometimes uh, a whole arm of a chromosome will be, will be replicated or deleted, um, and we'll see examples of that. And then you can have focal CNAs, and these are deletions or amplifications of a very high amplitude, so you get many, many copies of an, of an amplification, or you could get a complete removal of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a deletion um, that, that tend to target one or just a few, few genes. And because of that, because they're so focused, um, and if they hit the right gene, uh, often those are uh, a good sign that that's being selected for in the development of the cancer, in the evolution of the cancer. And so, so therefore, um, we're really quite interested in these. Uh, when you're doing uh, uh, copy number alterations uh, studies, this is, these are the things that we're really um, after because they're very strong signals in the data and they can be good indicators of, of so-called driver events. So you've covered drivers and passengers. I, have we covered that already? Okay. Okay. And, and to, like, evolution as a concept has been covered? Okay. So, so essentially a driver event is something that you could consider is, is, a, is an event that confers a phenotype that is selected for in the evolutionary progression of a, of a cancer. And, uh, and so, so these are really what we're, we're after when we do these genomic studies is, is we're trying to find driver events in the, in the genome. Uh, and then you've heard about uh, rearrangements. You've heard about translocations and gene fusions uh, um, yesterday, I think. So, you also define passenger? so passenger is, is um, so passenger is essentially an event that comes along for the ride. So, so you can imagine that uh, cancer as an evolutionary process where um, essentially there's stochastic element or random element of, of genome shuffling that goes on. And um, at the same time that the genome is shuffled, uh, you may get a driver event, um, a passenger event occurs, but it's actually the driver event that confers the phenotype. The, the passenger event doesn't actually do anything, um, doesn't, doesn't alter the function. Can the passenger um, that, well, yeah, so, so that's, you mean a compensatory type of effect? So, so that would be, I mean, I think that would, if it alters the phenotype of the cell, I think we, by definition, it would be not be a, not be a, uh, a passenger. So, yeah. So if you were to, let's say, to have a driver event that happened, if, is, and I don't know if this was the before, but can you lose that driver event if it's not needed anymore? It's just, it happened and then drove it to... Yeah. Well, so so the the classic case where a driver might be lost is that actually if you have um, a, a population of a tumor is often composed of different populations of cells. So one population can harbor a driver that's really um, creating the malignancy, and then hiding underneath that is a is a different population of cells that may not actually harbor that driver, but has a different driver. And so um, drugs are often target, try to target these drivers. So if you have, um, well, well, might as well just move to this slide then. So this is the classic case. Um, this is uh, ERBI2, which is also called HER2. The protein is called HER2, chromosome 17 in, uh, in breast cancer. And this is essentially the, the presence of this amplification. So what's shown here is um, arrayed along the x-axis is the genomic position on chromosome 17. <laughs> And each dot here essentially represents the amount of genetic material at each locus. And, and it's a noisy measurement, so you don't see it right on a, on a line. It's a, it's a slightly noisy measurement, and we'll get into how we, how we deal with that. But essentially, the blue areas are, um, are copy number neutral areas of the, of the genome. Um, and, and in this particular tumor, uh, there's a, a massive amplification of, of, of this gene called, called RB2. Um, and, and, then, and then the rest of the chromosome essentially diploid. And so, so there's a targeted therapy that um, was developed in the 90s uh, called Herceptin, or trastuzumab in, in, in the generics term, that specifically targets this protein and, um, and will inhibit uh, its expression. And so this is a particular example of, uh, of, uh, of a targeted therapy uh, that, that really goes after a specific copy number lesion, and, and this is really a, a case where women who had this type of, of cancer, um, it, it would, they would basically have a worse prognosis um, and, and would succumb to their disease very quickly within a couple of years. And the advent of Herceptin has essentially transformed that disease into, um, into a, a situation where most women do quite well. There is 
acquired resistance, however, in some cases. And that's because uh, essentially you can kill the cells that harbor this abnormality, but that creates a selection pressure that then drives a different, um, uh, a different genetic uh, pro reprogramming of the, of the cells. So, so that, that's a situation where a driver can be lost in the presence of the selective pressure of chemotherapy. Yeah. Is this a SNP again? Yes. This is, this is, uh, is Affymetrix SNP6 data. Um, so it's so 1.5 kb. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. Do I understand correctly that all changes uh, can be classified into either driver events or passenger events? And that the driver events, if targeted, would actually affect or would be treatable? Uh, potentially. I mean, so there are many, there can be many driver events that we don't have, that we don't have targeted therapy for. Um, uh, right, so, so that, that was the actionable. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we're, we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, but but no, I, I don't think all events can be you know, classified as drivers and passengers. Um, I would say that there are backseat drivers as well. <laughs> so uh, so these are uh, these are uh, they come along for the ride, but they do some yapping from the back, and and so uh, can can also um, drive the, the phenotype of the cell as well. Okay, so, so let's just look at the effect. So why is this important? And, and, and the, the most important copy number alterations essentially through gene dosage effects drive the expression of, uh, of those genes. So you learned about gene expression at the WASU yesterday probably, right? More than you care to know. Uh, but so what causes changes in gene expression? This is one mechanism that causes gene, uh, changes in gene expression. It's copy number changes. And so here what's plotted is uh, uh, in this two-dimensional plots are the copy number on the x-axis and the gene expression on the y-axis. This is again is a set of uh, 1,000 breast tumors um, and, and different genes here. So here's ERB2. So, so ERB2 is interesting. So here, what's colored here are the different copy number states. So uh, uh, green is, is a lesion, blue is neutral, and then uh, increasing uh, uh, brightness is, uh, is, is, is increasing copy number levels. Um, and so, so you can see up here, these are the cases um, with ERB2 uh, high level amplifications and they have the highest expression in the population. Okay. So, so there's an association here between what's happening in the genome and what's happening in the transcriptome. So, so that's a gene dosage effect. Let's drive in. Here's just some other examples. These are the most highly correlated um, <clears throat> profiles where, and, and you can think of these as kind of two distributions, so the, the part of the distribution that uh, actually harbors the, the alterations are really sort of to the right of zero, and, and in those cases uh, you get a, a response and expression, and essentially the more copies of the gene you have, the more highly expressed it is. Okay. Yes? So they can be. Um, these are uh, so so the pathogenic uh, variations that that we're really concerned with, and in, in probably in this lab, and, and most of the driver events that we're talking about, these are acquired throughout the life history of the tumor. Um, and so you know, these are these are not events that one is born with. If if um, <clears throat> if you were born with a HER2 amplification like this, you probably would never make it as a normal human. Yeah, embryonic, yeah, embryonic lethal. Okay, so, so here's the other end of the spectrum. So those were, those were amplifications. And here are specific examples of, of deletions. And again, it's the same uh, color scheme here. So we have uh, uh, the chromosome, the x-axis represents the position on the chromosome. Each dot represents um, essentially 1.5 1, 1 kb segment across the genome. And, and then here, here what's plotted is, it are just individual um, uh, tumors that we looked at. And, um, and so what you can see is within these dotted lines here, uh, that represents the borders of a gene called P10. This is a tumor suppressor gene. And so the bright green represents uh, a situation where essentially both copies have been lost. So this P10 is just not there at all 
in these tumors. And, and this is a, this is you know well-known driver, and, and so this is how it, how it looks when you have a deletion of, of P10. So, um, and you'll notice that <clears throat> um, in the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, different tumors do it in different ways, but they all, that, so, so each event is not exactly the same, so we don't have the same boundaries around, um, for example, uh, this one is a much broader deletion, um, and this one, uh, this one here is really quite focal, it's just, just basically just contains P10 and not much else. This one is even, um, even subgenic, so this, 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 contain, this, is, this is happening even within the boundary of the gene, so it only takes out a couple of exons. Okay, so, and this is the classic pattern of a, of a tumor suppressor, so as long as the gene is inactivated somehow, uh, then that's all that really matters, and that's the phenotype that gets selected for. And, and P10 is also subject to mutations as well, and so you can have truncating mutations and different type of mutations that essentially inactivate the protein. Okay? One Hi, Ian. How are you? Good. Yes? If we went looking for the next, another tumor suppressor gene, uh, would we also see the same pattern? Yeah, so, so it depends. Um, so P53, for example, which is the probably the most famous tumor suppressor gene, um, it, it actually rarely shows this, this phenotype. It's almost, al almost always, not always, but almost always inactivated by mutation. So by truncating mutation or insertion deletion at the very nucleotide level. So I'm talking about a one base insertion or frame shifting insertion or deletion. And so, uh, but however, something like CDKN2A or P16, which is probably the second most famous tumor suppressor, uh, you'd see this pattern as well. And RB, RB shows this pattern as well, RB1. Yes? <coughs> So if you have mis-sense mutation, it means you have accumulation and functional protein. Is it equal to copy number of? Uh, no, no. So, <clears throat> so there's a quite a distinction there between a, a mis-sense mutation and a and a, and a and a copy number change like this. So, so this would actually um, basically result in, in in no translation of the protein because it's not it's not there. Um, it's never actually expressed. So you don't get a message. Um, in the case of a missense mutation, um, so a message would be made and a protein would likely be made. It would just be have a, maybe an altered function. Um, in the case of a truncating mutation or a nonsense mutation, um, the message would be made uh, and, and the protein would be made, but it would be truncated and therefore degraded quickly. And so, uh, so it wouldn't have the, the chance. And, and, and sometimes the message itself is, is subject to uh, nonsense mediated decay. And so the, pro the levels of the protein would be reduced in, in that case. How often is there not a correlation between expression level and copy number variation? Um, quite often. Yeah, quite often, actually. So, so in this study, um, uh, which just, just came out uh, last month, is um, so we found that there is a correlation um, in approximately 30% of genes. And so, uh, so if you think that maybe the baseline expression, you know, maybe 50% of genes are expressed at any given tissue type, then that leaves about 20% of genes that, um, that are probably subject to different types of regulation. And that could be epigenetic regulation, could be regulation through mutation, um, or, uh, or other factors. This is for drivers and passengers? Uh, yeah, so that's right. This is just for all genes. Um, uh, and and so, so it could be that, in fact, some alterations just don't, don't have any effect at all um, on, on the expression levels. In this particular study, we actually used the idea of, uh, of a strong association between uh, copy number change and, and expression level as, 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 as a al different definition for a driver in the sense that um, that gene is driven by its copy number level, um, it, whereas other genes could be regulated by epigenetic regulation. Yes? That's what we do sequencing for. Okay. All right. Um, so, so these are just some genes that are, are known to be affected by somatic copy number alterations. I've already mentioned ERB2. Other genes, um, this is a highly related gene called EGFR, um, the, the MYC oncogene, uh, PI3 kinase, 
IGF-1R, FGFR2, KRAS, CDK4, CDK6. These are all genes that have been shown in different cancer types um, to be subject to these um, focal and high-level amplifications. Deletions um, uh, are known to affect genes like RB1. This is the first, essentially, tumor suppressor that was discovered. Um, P10, CDKN2A and 2B, which I've um, right, mentioned already. Um, uh, arid one a nf1 um, and these are all this list is growing um, as as large scale studies um, essentially make it out into the public domain um, this long this list is going to get longer and longer and longer and we're going to learn more and more about uh, which genes uh, are subject uh, to this type of um, alteration in the genome and and so some examples of this um, that have appeared in the literature recently are are, are these papers. So this was a uh, a couple of papers that are, occurred in Nature, which are essentially pan cancer uh, interrogations of um, of literally thousands of tumors across different types sub subtypes using um, high density genotyping arrays to try to determine the copy number landscape of, of different diseases and the patterns of of copy number alterations are nicely described in here. Um, there are specific tumor type um, papers that are that are starting to emerge. Uh, uh, large scale studies, 500 cancers, uh, well, three, 300 cancers in here, 200 cancers in here. But uh, we're going to see very soon um, a couple of breast cancer papers, one from our group, one from uh, and one from the TCJ uh, that that describe the landscape of of copy number alterations in the large populations of tumors. And these, all these studies have revealed uh, uh, new genes that are uh, of interest, that are potentially targetable, that are driving the phenotype of the malignancies. Um, and so you should read these papers um, to, to, to see an example of, uh, of applied analysis of this type of, um, this type of alteration. So uh, what was asked before is um, actionable alterations. So the, the classic um, and, and biggest success story in our field is, is really um, ERB2 and, and trastuzumab, uh, but there are others. So uh, there are uh, targeted therapies against uh, EGFR, um, uh, platelet-derived growth, growth factor receptor, um, uh, drugs that target uh, PSV kinase, um, and, and actually, the, I mean, I would say the other classic um, success story is the BCR ABLE, um, which is targetable by imatinib. So this is the um, Philadelphia chromosome. It essentially defines the disease, and um, all, all CMLs harbor this alteration, and, uh, and, and the drug Gleevec or imatinib was developed to specifically target um, that, that oncogenic protein. And, and so what was, again, once a, a very difficult disease to manage um, has a targeted therapy based on the discovery of, 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 of a genomic abnormality. And tomorrow, or later this afternoon, we'll cover some, um, some mutations that are targetable. Um, so, so I just thought I'd go over, um, cause, yes, oh, yes, yes. So, um, EGFR, some, a lot of them, I guess, appear twice, but just as, as an example, you have an under amplification, you have a bigger point to mm -hmm. and also the therapeutic agent is pretty much the same. Yeah. So, um, what's happening to the point mutation? Yeah, so, so the point mutations are hitting the kinase domain, and what that does is it results in a downstream signaling um, cascade and, and, and drives a growth pathway um, in the same way that gene dosage effect um, drives the pathway. So, so it's a point mutation that is, uh, these are usually um, very specific, and I'll get into that this afternoon, is, is what, you know, what do hotspot mutations look like in terms of when they activate a protein. Um, to, to, uh, that, that has a very, has a pretty, pretty unique pattern. And so, so some of these, um, and we're actually finding mutations in RB2 as well um, when we're starting to sequence breast cancers. And um, it's the same type of thing. They're kinase domain mutations that, um, that drive, uh, that tend to drive the pathway. So the end result is the same. The end result is the same. And so that's why they can be targeted with the same agents. Yeah, so. Yes? Given that these large chunks of DNA are shuffling or how do we know that the, um, or not, how do we know that the, the gene, that the actual driver of the mutation is not a gene that's supposed to be preventing it's supposed to be preventing it? Ah, 
Yeah, so that's good. So, so, so cancer is a temporal, uh, it you know, follows an evolutionary path. And so, um, so drivers can, can accrue at uh, different points in, in, in the evolution. So, so, so an uh, initial event may be uh, uh, essentially you remove uh, a guardian of gen genomic stability, so, or DNA repair, um, or homologous recombination. So, so we have, um, uh, you remove the capacity of a cell to repair itself, then, then these CNAs can accumulate. Um, and, and so eventually uh, a CNA can, can hit a gene um, in, in such a way that then that, that becomes a new driver. Um, and so there's a temporal uh, series of events that essentially lead to the cancer when we observe it. Um, and, and so, so and, and drivers can happen at any time along that, that point, along, along that, that history. Okay. Yes? Yeah, <coughs> that, that's, that's generally true, and I, I may have a slide on EGFR somewhere that I can show you, but um, essentially, I mean, e, e, when, when EGFR is, uh, is amplified, it, it, looks like, it looks like this. I mean, it's, it, it is just unmistakable. There are hundreds of copies, as you probably know, um, and that's very different than, than just a, a, a single copy gain of, of all the chromosome 7. Um, and so, so that, that would have a very minor gene dosage effect where this has a major, major effect. And, and, and these types of alterations tend to be restricted to just the gene or maybe the surrounding partners, whereas, you know, something that's less, that's more benign and is actually more difficult to interpret when you get a chromosome arm level um, shift that may just be a result of, of, uh, of, of a lack of, um, of being able to, to, to repair that, so some t telomerase type of um, uh, abnormality that where the telomeres can't correctly um, uh, be repaired in, in replication. <coughs> Yes. When you get these high level amplifications, do they tend to be tandem arrays or double minutes or uh, uh, sorry, I don't understand the question. Like, I mean you've got so here you've got what uh, ten or fifteen copies of mm. So you mean it's the whole set is it are they tandem duplications? Tandem right. Kind of um so well um I think the jury's still out on that. Um, what, what's interesting is that uh, that's what we're learning from sequencing is actually, so how does this happen? Where do they get deposited? Where, where do these chunks happen? Are they all sequentially arrayed in, you know, side by side? Or, or, or actually when, when, when there's a, a replication loop like that, do, do those bits of DNA get incorporated somewhere else? Maybe because of nuclear proximity in the 3D nuclear architecture, for example. Um, and so, so some of the sequencing studies are really showing that uh, these types of events actually may get deposited at multiple places in the genome. Um, and, and so, so you know, each event might actually be, be quite different. And at the end of the lecture, I'll talk about a phenomenon called chromothripsis, which is essentially like a chromosome shattering, and then um, the chromosome just gets blown up into bits and then reassembled. Um, and, and so that creates a whole whole other type of phenotype that um, that, that that we can measure now with, with sequencing. Yeah. So so I think we're still gaining an, an understanding of actually what is the structure of these, and and that's what sequencing technology can actually give us. Okay. Um, okay. So so just briefly now. So. Um, so this is a, a project that I worked on for, uh, for, for quite some time, about four, four or five years. And, um, and what we set out to do is, is to do high-density genotype arrays um, to explore the, the uh, both, both genotyping arrays and expression arrays to explore the genomic and transcriptomic architecture of, of, of a large population of, of breast cancers. And so, um, so what I wanted to show here is um, you recall back to that first uh, landscape plot that I showed, and um, and and you can see that these types of um, uh, alterations were really quite broad, 
Um, and, and when you sort of lay the expression landscape over top of that copy number landscape, and we just focus on the, the high level events that I showed, uh, and, and the homozygous deletions are when two copies are deleted. And we overlay um, situations where we, uh, we look at the expression of those genes in those, in those particular tumors, and, and we see that they have some sort of outlying distribution, so they're way different than the rest of their population. Um, and that, and the, the assumption is, is that it's because we have a presence of an extreme copy number event and the expression of an extreme, uh, extreme uh, measurement of expression, that, that they may be associated. And so when we plot the frequency of that, we see that the landscape gets, gets very sharply focused into these nice peaks. Um, so so here, here is our, our Bosch gene, here is ERB2. Um, and and in, in nearly um, in a large percentage of the, the cases where we have copy number alterations, um, we have uh, also have outlying expression. And so this is this is the, the sharpest peak in the whole landscape. Um, we have uh, another peak like that at, uh, at AP12, um, and this this harbors the uh, FGFR1 locus and is also um, uh, harbors ZNF703, uh, which uh, some colleagues published as being a, a, a new driver event in, in breast cancer as a result of this data analysis. Um, and, and then here we have uh, what the, the, the second most frequent amplicon is essentially, is actually two peaks. So this is really quite interesting. And um, this is 11Q13, and we have the CCND1 locus here. And then we have a locus here that, that has a, a, a about 13 different genes in it, and um, and and this was really a, a, a defining feature of a of a subtype that I'm going to talk about in in a, in a minute, and so and then s s sort of smattered through the whole landscape are a relatively infrequent um, but but very significant drivers in the sense that um, they're not. They're not frequent in the population in terms of being, you know, 50 percent or even even 20 percent or 10 percent. Uh, but but nonetheless, um, these are these would be important targets to pursue uh, in a rare uh, number of cancers. So here's IGF1R, uh, here's CCNE1, um, and and then in the tumor suppressor landscape, which is um, you know, these are genes that are uh, homozygously deleted and then have um, subsequent or consequent loss of expression. Uh, we have identified PPP2R2A as a potential novel target, uh, and and also um, MAP2K4 as a, uh, a this is really confirmed uh, in in breast cancer in the study as being a, a novel tumor suppressor. Um, so this is a, a this is a type of has the same type of um, structure as the P10 locus that I showed. So that's obviously a known and very famous tumor suppressor, and this is a novel one that we identified. So this is frequency of Yeah, frequency, that's right. So how do you define whether it's high copy number or not? Yes, yeah, so well, that, you'll do that today <laughs> in the lab. Yeah, you'll, 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 you'll learn all about that. Okay. Because here I see on, on chromosome 8, yeah. like, there seem to be a, lots of gene candidates that mm. seem to be amplifying many, many patients. Yeah. So how do we know? That we want to ignore gene A and not gene B. Oh yeah, so so I mean I think all of these peaks are probably of interest. Um, these are just uh, we've denoted um, a couple. And this there's no question these broader regions are much more difficult to interpret. Mm -hmm. The focal regions are 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 the regions that are easy to interpret because they only harbor a couple of genes. And and looking at the the biology of the gene, you can often tell you something about whether that's likely the driver or not. These broader regions are still difficult. Chromosome one has is similar like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, do amplification events usually happen in tandem with deletion events, or like if it looked, if I were to look at this one way, I would say, well, most of the time it's about amplification, but then I realize, well, perhaps it's actually something that happens. Like, like these things aren't single events, but they're joined. Because uh, it does look like there are very few deletion events relative to them. Yeah. Well, you can imagine that um, it's easy to copy something many, many times. Um, and and it's actually, there's no limit. There's no upper bound um, in terms of amplification. But of course, there's a lower bound with respect to deletions. You can, if, you, if you're diploid, you can only lose two copies. 
Um, and actually, it's probably, um, the cell can probably tolerate amplifications much better than it could deletions. So, so if you really whack out um, yeah, too much, then the proteins that you might whack out a housekeeping gene, and then that would just be lethal to the cell. And it would never get selected for it. So, so, so you're right in the sense that amplifications are probably much more common, and, that, and those are some of the reasons why. Yeah. Yes? Oh, okay. all right. We have a lot of material still to cover. So, okay, okay, okay. All right, okay. Good. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just plow plow ahead then. So, so one of the the, the major results of this is with with a population of two thousand tumors, um, we really want to try to look at whether breast cancer could be um, further subdivided into, in, 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 into specific groups. Um, it would, before we started this project, it has been kind of accepted in the field that essentially five um, subtypes that were uh, discovered through expression profiling. Um, and, but, but a lot of those studies were determined based on relatively small sample size, so 200 tumors, 300 tumors, that type of thing. Um, and, and very few, uh, well, there, there was really no high-resolution look at the genome in, in tandem with the, with the transcriptome. And, and so we, we, we were asking questions from the perspective of, can the population of breast cancer be further stratified uh, into, into more refined groups based on a large sample size and a high-resolution look at the genome and the simultaneous look at this genome and the transcriptome? And what we found is that there are essentially 10 uh, reliable subgroups, um, and, and this isn't, you know, it's not the definitive answer. It's not like there are, uh, there are 10 and, 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 and that's it. Um, there are likely others as well, but what we found in this data set, by splitting the data set into two groups, so we had a discovery set and a validation set. We did the discovery work on the first thousand, uh, and then val tried to validate that in the, in the, in the second thousand over here. Um, and, and essentially what, what's shown here, and, and these plots were made by Gavin, um, are uh, the frequency of alteration uh, in each one of these, um, these ten groups. Um, and then what's shown on the bottom of each track is essentially the, the specificity um, or the, the subtype specificity of those alterations in the group. So where you see black, that means that those, those regions are, are different than the rest of the, 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 the distribution of, of, of these regions is different than the rest of the, the population. Um, so, so the black really uh, identifies the subtype specific abnormalities that essentially uh, define the group. And so, so here's a group that um, uh, essentially uh, defined by, by the AP alteration and then some other, um, some other things are going on in the genome as well. Um, this group here is, is AP12. Um, this is that very focal region that I showed that has that ZNF703 uh, uh, amplification. Um, this one here is the ERB2 group. Um, so, so this is a very strong signal in the data. I'm sorry if it's hard to see, but there's a very focal spike right at the ERB2 gene, um, and that's, that's what defines that group. And, um, and then uh, over here, I mentioned that we have this, uh, uh, this uh, 11Q13 amplification that harbors CCND1 and, and some other genes uh, in, second, in that second little amplicon. And this was, a, this was a, a, a new discovery because, actually, um, this is ex composed exclusively of, uh, of ER-positive tumors. And the reason why this is important is that, um, so generally speaking, ER, ER positive, when I say ER, I mean estrogen receptor. So I should back up a little bit and say that in, in the clinical practice, there are really C three subtypes. Um, there's ER positive, ER negative, and, and HER2 positive. And, um, and so those are the, that's the clinical assay that, um, that breast cancer patients get, um, get prescribed when they, when they get diagnosed. And we measure expression levels of estrogen receptor and, and HER2. And if they're HER2 positive, they get um, uh, Herceptin-based therapy. If they're ER positive, they get hormone-based therapy. And if they're ER negative, then we don't really have a, a, good, um, a, a good therapy for them. Yes? Did I understand correctly that the HER2 positive uh, patients, they are all that's right. So everyone else is referred to. That's correct. Yeah. But why are there not overlapping the 
because the people can't have printed your phones even at the airport. Yeah, so, so that's what, um, let me see if I can show you that. Um, so uh, so what, um, what's shown here is um, these are just defined by the, essentially the HER2 amplicon and, and, and overexpression of, of HER2. And, um, and and then what's shown over here, I didn't really go into detail here, but um, uh, these are the expression-based subtypes. So, so this is, uh, these are luminal A and luminal B. So these are ER positive cases here. Okay, um, and and so so just to sh just um, one more thing to, to mention here in this group here, this is actually the largest group, and and what's interesting about this group, and this is really about seventeen percent of the population, is is what do you notice? What do you notice here? It's it's flat, right? There's 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 nothing going on. So so this is a really curious um, finding in the sense that sense that seventeen percent of breast cancers uh, actually don't really harbor alterations in, in, in terms of a copy number perspective. They're relatively quiescent genomes. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the next hypothesis is that um, maybe these are, uh, these are driven by mutations, maybe driven by epigenetic changes. Um, that's, that's a follow-up question that we're pursuing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so the other aspect of this project, and, and this is really a uh, a massive tour de force um, to, to collect this, and, and um, my colleague Sam Aparicio uh, really, uh, and Carlos called us in Cambridge, um, led this project in accruing the sample set, um, and they, uh, they had to get, basically went to five different centers in the UK and Canada to accrue a population level of this size, um, and, and one of the criteria for inclusion was that we had long-term follow-up um, in terms of, of, of clinical, uh, clinical data. So, um, and in some cases, we had up to 15 years follow-up uh, on, these, on these tumors, and, and a minimum of, of five years was the, was the criteria. So we could then ask, um, what does this all mean in the context of, of the clinical perspective? So is any of this stuff, it's fine to say that we found these interesting patterns in the genomics, but does this have any impact on, on prognostication? Um, and so what's shown here is a Kaplan-Meier plot, um, and you'll, I think you'll, you know, do these types of plots on uh, on day five in this workshop, um, and so the first thing I want to just point out is that this group here. Um, uh, so, how many people have seen Kaplan-Meier plots before? Okay, so essentially, what they measure is is the proportion of uh, of survivors in a particular group uh, as a function of time. Okay, so the x-axis is, is, is time, and this is basically time after uh, the last date of, uh, uh, time after diagnosis. And, um, and then this, this shows essentially the proportion of patients in a particular group that's still alive after some, some degree of time. Okay, and, and I won't dwell on, on, on that because you're going to learn that in great detail on Friday. But essentially what, what this means is that if, if the curve stays high, then that is a good prognosis. If the curve um, goes low, then that's a very poor prognosis. So a lot of these patients were, um, were accrued uh, before the advent of Herceptin. And so this group five, which has a very poor prognosis, this is the HER2 positive group here. Okay, so, so you can see that before Herceptin, um, th this, was, this is really a, a, a very, very morbid, um, had a high morbidity uh, subtype. And, and we had a very steep, uh, steep morbidity trajectory. These days, that curve would probably be somewhere around, around here. Um, you would see it shift up towards the top, top right. Um, what I wanted to just point out is that um, uh, we also have this, this, this group up here, which is um, essentially a, a group with, with very good, good prognosis. Um, and, and what was very curious is that we have this group, this green group, okay? Um, this was the group with the 11Q13 uh, Q ampl amplification. So these are all ER positive tumors. And, and before we did this study, these would likely be grouped in with this, with this pink curve. And you can see that there's the, the genomic split um, correlates strongly with, uh, with an inferior prognosis. And so this identifies now a new subgroup 
Um, and and it's, only, uh, it's only about 4, four to 5 percent of the population. It's a small percentage of the population, but, um, but this is a group that really warrants, um, warrants major attention and, and, and potentially, you know, our, our work here has identified potentially some targets to pursue um, uh, in the same way that we can maybe target Herceptin, uh, HER2 with Herceptin, um, there may be a gene in there because it's a high level amplification that, that may be targetable with, with a new therapy. Yes? I just noticed something interesting. The, the group in the last one which had almost no alteration, so that's actually the second best yep. in this case. This one here? Yeah. And what's what's protecting the <laughs> Yeah, well, so 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 one one possibility is that you know these just ge these genomes aren't aren't that evolved, so the, the the tumors actually haven't progressed to a point where they've acquired a, a really nasty aggressive phenotype. Um, so that, that that might be one possibility is that we've just observed them er relatively earlier in their in their clinical stage. The other thing that's associated um, with this group is that we found um, a. a a, a strong signal of lymphocytic infiltration in these tumors, and so there's a strong immune response uh, in these in these tumors. Yeah, in, in that particular group, um, and and that suggests that there may be some sort of uh, um, uh, these are these are tumors that are subject to um, to to being um, controlled by the immune system. Yes. Your 2,000 patients were they um, uniform as far as race? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we, that, that's a very good question. We try to look at that. Um, the answer is probably no. Uh, there's, there's a bias there um, uh, in different regions. So uh, one of the hospitals uh, is, is in a predominantly African uh, community in England. Um, our hospitals in Vancouver probably have an overrepresentation of, uh, of a Chinese population. Um, so, so no, there would be some bias there for sure. Um, yeah, we, we did we did try to do that, and, and you know, there wasn't. We looked at the genotypes um, because these are these are actually genotyping arrays, so so we could actually look at that um, question. Um, and there wasn't a strong signal there in terms of um, whether there was association or, or a confounding factor in terms of the as these outcomes. So yeah, that, that that's that's the other thing is that um, you know the genome wide association folks you know. You, Try to do this with that, tens of thousands of patients, and, and so you know this was not the point of the study. Uh, but yeah, it's a fair question for sure. Yes. Why you choose ten group? Obviously, ten group. Yeah. So that was uh, that was discovered. Basically, we did um, a de novo clustering of the of the data. So we we took the um, we took the data, and. Uh, we looked at the most uh, variable features uh, from a gene perspective in the whole population, and then we clustered using a joint measure of um, uh, where, where both copy number features and expression features were included, and we clustered the data uh, that way. And um, and so uh, uh, the ten groups emerged from that that de novo clustering, unsupervised. Yeah. How many features? So two thousand. Okay, so um, the other interesting observation that emerged from this, and I think this is something that um, that the field is really going to get um, rapidly excited about now, is is the idea that it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between a copy number change in a gene and an expression in a gene. Okay, so you can imagine a situation where, um, so again, this is copy number on the x-axis, and and um, and this is gene expression location, uh, the, the location of a, uh, a gene on, on, on the y-axis. And what's shown here is in each point in this matrix is whether we have a, uh, a positive correlation in red or, uh, uh, sorry, in green or, or negative correlation in red, um, where, where you have a uh, copy number change in one location um, is correlated with genes at many other locations in the genome. Okay, so you have a single copy number event that is associated with gene expression changes across the genome. And so, so you, you know, you can imagine a situation where uh, you could have a, a transcriptional activator, for example. So a gene that, um, whose job it is to go and, and promote the regulation or promote the overexpression of, of many other genes. If you get a, 
extra copies of that protein, um, it may have widespread effects um, across, uh, across the whole genome. Another situation is where you could have, you can imagine a biochemical pathway uh, where if you drive, let's say, the top level of a, of a, of a biological cascade, um, it's going to have wide-reaching effects throughout that whole uh, cascade. And that's essentially what we observed. And, and so here we have, uh, this is actually a situation where we have a deletion in 5Q um, that essentially resulted in uh, a whole set of genes that uh, was, was, uh, were upregulated. So, so we probably have some sort of um, uh, cell cycle regulator in here. We don't exactly know what the target is yet. But, um, and, and the reason is because the, the, if you look at the pathways involved in, uh, in these genes, um, essentially, they're, they're involved in, in, in cell cycles, so M phase, aurora kinase signaling. Um, and then here you also have the FOXM1 transcription factor network. So, so there might be something to do with a, with a transcription factor that regulates many genes. Um, and, and, so, and then here's the G1S uh, transition. So, so, so this is a pattern that we observed in this data. And um, in a different, different analysis, uh, ERB2 shows up as one of these interesting targets as well. It, regulates uh, a, a large number of, of expression changes. And so, again, a single event that has wide-reaching effects across the genome. And, and so we need to start thinking about, um, uh, about biology of cancer and, 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 and what, what aberrations in the genome in terms of how they drive uh, transcription networks, um, and not just the transcription of a particular gene, but, but whole networks of genes. Um, and that's probably a concept that Gary might uh, cover in, in his lecture. Okay, so um, we'll plow on here. So that's the story uh, of, of this data set called Metabrick. And it is published, and you can, you can read about it in detail. Okay. It is in the EGA, yes. Um, at different levels, so, so you can get the, um, actually I think the segmented data will be presented today in the lab, is that right? Yeah, so, so we will work, work with the data today. Okay. Um, okay. So, what I've talked about so far is really just about, um, about copy number in, in aggregate. So, um, uh, so we're not concerned about the specific alleles uh, up until this point. And uh, what I wanted to move to now is, is to think about um, a genotype. So, so I don't know, if, did John go over genotype at all or what that means? Okay, so, so imagine you have, um, you have two alleles, okay, that you get one from your, your mother and one from your father. And we're going to call this allele A and allele B, okay? And uh, in, a, in a balanced uh, diploid case, um, you could have uh, three possibilities, okay? And so let, let's just look at this, this side here. So you could have um, a particular locus that has uh, AA. And, and actually, so, so I said maternal and paternal, but this could also be um, uh, described as major and minor in the sense that through population studies, we may have seen that one allele is dominant in the population, and another allele is, is less dominant and less frequent in the population. This is what consortium, like the HapMap consortium, uh, have worked out uh, for, for many, many positions in the genome. If you look at a database called dbSNP, um, all this is, is essentially well cataloged uh, for a large number of polymorphisms in the genome. So, so if you consider this major and minor, um, this is a situation where both the maternal and, and paternal allele are, are the major allele. Um, here you have a situation where you have um, uh, you have the maternal is is uh, or you have a major and a minor allele, and then here you have homozygous uh, for the minor allele. Uh, and so that's in the diploid situation. That's where you have two copies everywhere. But what happens when you have an extra copy? So if you have three copies, then clearly one of the alleles only must have been amplify, right, so, or, or, or duplicate it. So that induces a, a new genotype state space or a possibility, a possibilities of what uh, genotypes we can get. So you can have all A's, so, so that could be a situation where you started here and you just copied that one. Um, or you could have, uh, you started here and you ended up with an extra copy of A, uh, and set, et cetera, okay? 
Um, so, so that's another uh, state space that gets induced. Um, and the same, by the same extension, uh, you, could, you could have the same type of um, extension of a genotype space uh, with, with four copies or five copies, okay? So uh, now, if we consider, uh, if the starting point is always diploid, so imagine a situation where you have, um, in the normal cells, we look at all positions that are diploid heterozygous. So all positions start here. And then we look at the tumor. Um, well, we get uh, the induction of, of what we call different zygosity status, okay? So you can imagine if you started out diploid AB, um, and in the tumor, we observe that, that, that now it had become AA. We call that loss of heterozygosity. So, so this is a heterozygous allele uh, in, the sense that, in the sense that you have um, two different uh, two different alleles, it's heterozygous, and then uh, the loss of that heterozygosity induces something like this, okay? And that can go in both directions, so you can start here and you can go, uh, you can become homozygous that way, or you can become homozygous that way. And by extension, um, the same thing applies to all these different copy number states. So, so what that looks like in actual data, um, oh, this is black and white, okay? Uh, that's fine. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so somehow this got um, black and white, but, but look at your page instead of the screen. Um, so, so this is a region, uh, this is actually sequencing data from breast cancer. I think you're actually going to work with this particular data set um, in the lab. And so, so what's plotted here, what Gavin did is he went and they looked at um, he tried to find all the heterozygous positions in the normal genome. Okay, so this is a situation where we sequence the normal uh, from, from blood, and then we have the, the tumor DNA from the, from the tumor. Okay? So, so these are all positions um, that, uh, that, sh that were heterozygous in, uh, in the normal. And, and the definition of that was really that um, the allelic ratio, so um, we haven't really got to sequencing data and what that looks like in terms of, uh, in terms of allelic counts, but, uh, but you can imagine that half the reads that cover this particular region were, um, were from one allele and half the reads for the other. So it's centered somewhere around 0.5, okay? And then in the tumor, we can look at those same exact positions, and, and we see that, um, uh, so down here is what's plotted as the copy number, and, uh, uh, and and this is um, this is this is also derived from the sequence data, and we'll get into the, how we do that. But uh, but just take this um, a, as it is for now. So we have some diploid regions, we have some deleted regions, and we have some um, some gained regions here. And you can see that um, that results uh, these these deletions and these amplifications result in shifts away from that 0.5. So. So you have, um, now you have what you have is kind of this noisy representation where the mean isn't really at 0.5 anymore. It's, it's really shifted away from that. And in this situation, we have a deletion that's induced loss of heterozygosity, um, and, and that's because one copy is essentially gone, okay? Here you have a situation where you have an allele-specific amplification. So, um, and the reason we know that is that um, it's not a balanced amplification because we'd still see a pattern that's this, like, clustered around 0.5. Instead, what we have is we have a shifting away from that. And so we get um, uh, a genotype space that is more like AAAAB or ABBBB, for example. Um, and so you have a shifting away. And this is what we call, uh, we still consider this heterozygous, but we call it an allele-specific copy number change. Um, so, so you can see that um, in aggregate, the alleles definitely have been shifted, but it's really just one one actual allele that's the, is, is what's getting copied. The other one is actually uh, is unaffected. Um, and then you have uh, this really important region here, which is essentially copy number diploid. Okay, so this is two copies. Um, it's neutral uh, in, in the sense from this copy number perspective, but there's loss of heterozygosity here. So, so what do you think could have happened here? What could have given rise to this? Any ideas? So, so copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. How do we get that? How do we get there? Right. So, so it's a stepwise process, and you must have had two events to get there. 
And, and so we could have, we would have had to have um, first had this event where we have a deletion, and then the remaining allele uh, is, is what gets copied, um, is what gets duplicated again. So you have, my pointer is really not working here. Um, anyway, so you, so you have uh, a deletion followed by a duplication, and, and that gives rise to a signal that's very similar to this, but the copy number is, is neutral. Okay, is that clear? All right. Just uh, what you did, you started from people you knew had This is this is the same individual. So this is this is the normal, just the normal yeah, right. one one person one person. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, he said. Okay. Yep. Mm. Yes. Yes. Uh, only one step. Um, difficult because uh, what, what the power of doing something like this is you get a whole block. So this this may represent um, what is this? Probably about ten thousand steps in here. Gavin, approximately. Yeah. Okay, so well, let's say let's say more than a thousand data points in here. Yeah, uh, yeah, several megabases in here. Um, so, so several thousand data points in here uh, to get the signal. But you can imagine that. So, so what's going on here is that you still get some some of those regions are show show fifty fifty, and those are probably just regions that are not well covered in the in the uh, in the sequencing space. So, if you got unlucky and you just looked at this. You know, one of the data points right here, uh, you would think that there's no LOH. There's no loss of heterozygosity. Right? You just get unlucky. But when you look at an aggregate across the whole space of a thousand, um, a thousand data points, then the signal becomes very clear that this whole region is, is similarly affected, and this is probably just noise in the system. So what's the minimum signal? Well, um, one gene. So you could look in very, I mean, you could do a uh, very detailed analysis in one gene. Um, so, so this is really, uh, I, you know, I haven't gone into sequencing yet, um, so, so that's coming in the next, in this afternoon, but, but basically, I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the choices in experimental design for sequencing is how much sequence do I obtain uh, for my particular uh, whole genome or my gene of interest. If you're only looking at one gene, you can afford to, to sequence it in great detail, in great depth. Um, and so, so that, that may be enough then, because, uh, because if, you, if you go deep on, on one particular locus or, or a small number of loci, that should give you a very clear indication of what's going on. Um, of course, you can't afford to go very, very deep across the whole genome, because it would, it would just cost too much. But if you're just looking at one gene, you can sequence very deeply. So, yeah, this, this is actually sequence data. It's a sequence data. So, so what's your, this is from one patient? This is from one patient. So what's your interpretation of um, these regions that uh, lose heterozygosity but not copy them? Yeah, so, so what, what may happen, and we'll, we'll get into this in this afternoon, is that, um, so, so why, you know, why is it uh, <coughs> advantageous um, to, to have this second event, essentially. And, and the reason is, is that, so you can imagine that there's a, a, a sequence of events where you may have uh, a deletion. There's only one allele left. And in that situation, you may get a mutation. And, and so uh, the only protein that gets made in this situation is, uh, is the mutant protein. And, and then, uh, but it may be disadvantageous to have all the other genes in here uh, have lost the copy. And so, so the cancer wants to up the gene dosage of, of, the, of the remaining surrounding position, but keep that mutation. <laughs> so, so that could be a situation that um, gives rise to, to that. And so, so what, um, what we've been doing in, in my lab is really trying to associate 
um, uh, integrate this type of data with mutation data to try to, try to again, use it. That's another way to, to potentially identify uh, important tumor suppressors or, um, or, or driver genes through mutation. Yeah. I was just wondering, why is it two events if it was just one event from all this combination? Just the other one could copy the tumor. Yeah, so, but the cons so right. So, so the consequence could be that the, 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 the other one just gets clipped out, essentially. Yeah, that, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So, it depends what you want to do um, for uh, for things like looking at total copy number changes. Um, uh, people have shown that this can be really done with um, something around five to ten x. Actually, and the signal is quite readily apparent. Um, when you get into actually specific um, alleles and trying to find uh, SMBs or doing this type of analysis, uh, what we found is that you know, sub 30x it gets it, it's not as clean as um, as as more than 30x. But 30x is is actually even um, probably woefully inadequate, I would say, uh, for mutation analysis, and that's because. Um, you can imagine a cancer sample is, is uh, number one, is made up of a mixture of different cell populations. So it's heterogeneous mixture of cancer cells. And then admixed in there are normal cells that are just a part of the stroma or a part of the uh, lymphocytic infiltration. And so, so you could be measuring something 30 times, but uh, for a given mutation that is maybe present in 10%, um, of the cells, um, that's going to be represented in maybe two or three reads. And, and so you may get unlucky and just never see it. Okay. All right. So, so why are we interested in this? Um, well, this is, uh, this is really... Um, how many people have heard of the Knudsen two-hit hypothesis? It's classic stuff. Okay. All right. So, so Knudsen proposed uh, a, a paradigm whereby um, important genes essentially need to be um, inactivated in both both copies um, or both alleles, and um, and so uh, whereby if if um, this is the number of alleles here, uh, and this is the the follow-up. I think this is the this is what the 30th anniversary follow-up of the Newton hit two hit hypothesis. I think so. Is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, this is a nice paper that, um, that talked about this. So, so basically, we have uh, a, a very simple model where if you lose one allele, then um, then essentially the cells are vulnerable to becoming malignant, and you lose the second allele, um, and then the cell transforms into a malignant state. Um, in, in this situation, um, you, you, you have uh, essentially well, you, just inactivation of one allele is that already leads to a malignant phenotype, and then uh, if you lose the other allele, it gets even worse, um, and then and then you have uh, essentially uh, even even small changes um, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of the um, essentially a gene do, uh, an allele dosage effect, where uh, where we have. Um, uh, Severity of disease increasing, um, and then and then you have uh, a situation where actually, um, if you lose all of it, uh, then uh, then the the the, the cancer um, essentially that won't get selected for um, because that becomes uh, lethal to the cell, and so that's called somewhat quasi quasi sufficiency. So so the action is actually uh, in the in, in in the not the total loss but in the partial loss. Okay, so we are going to resume here, and I'm, I'm actually going to go a lot faster now, so I think I'll reserve um, questions. Uh, if you have something that's really burning and you can't wait, uh, go ahead and ask it, but I think we'll reserve questions in the interest of time um, till the end, okay? So, uh, so now let's talk about how to measure these events. We've talked about their biological consequences. We've talked about how they're observable in, in different tumor types. Um, 
But what I wanted to do now is, is just briefly go over some of the technologies we can use to measure these. And, and they really go from um, very low resolution uh, to, to uh, or low resolution and, and, and to, to high resolution. And um, although resolution is, can be defined in different ways. So, so this is fluorescence in situ hybridization. And, and what this shows is um, um, essentially a design of probes that, uh, that are f that fluorescently labeled probes that can actually uh, be incorporated into the nucleus of cells and, and of individual cells. And then through uh, essentially microscopy, um, one can look at uh, the presence of the number of copies of a particular probe uh, within individual cells. So while this is low resolution from the perspective that, you, you know, you can only really do this for a couple of loci um, uh, because it's labor intensive, it's very high resolution in terms of, um, in terms of looking at individual cells. And, and, and ultimately, you know, cancer, the, in terms of cancer evolution, the cell is the unit of selection. And so, um, so this is actually really quite, uh, really, could, could be quite powerful, fluorescence in situ hybridization. How many people have worked with that type of data before? Okay, a few. Okay, so this is this is widely used in in uh, pathology labs. Um, so so then, in the advent of uh, of the human genome, led to the ability then to design, um, generally speaking, uh, back probes, um, bacterial artificial chromosomes, uh, that that could be used to probe um, uh, literally 100, 100 kb chunks of the genome. Um, and in the, this really came to, to prominence in the, in the late, uh, in the early 2000s um, and, and through the mid 2000s. Uh, this was the, the method of choice array comparative genomic hybridization. Um, and, uh, and so the resolution is, is somewhere between uh, 30 and 100 KB. Uh, the advent of genotype arrays uh, started uh, sort of in the mid 2000s um, and, and uh, this has been uh, really the, the dominant platform, I would say, for the last uh, five years. Um, and, and we can probe up to two million positions in the genome. And so the average resolution is somewhere around 1.5 KB. Um, and, and all the data that I showed you, um, for the most part, uh, was done on, uh, on these types of arrays. Um, and here's just what it looks like. Uh, so it's just Affymetrics. Uh, and Illumina has a, a version, and um, I think uh, Agilent has a version as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we get to the 3G resolution, um, nucleotide resolution through whole genome shotgun sequencing. Okay. And, uh, and, and this is uh, basically, this will supplant everything else. Um, well, with the exception of maybe fish, we'll always want to do fish, um, but uh, uh, but 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 as sequencing technology uh, dominates and becomes cheaper and more affordable, um, uh, we're almost at a point where the the gap here is st is still about an order of magnitude. Um, so it costs five hundred bucks to do a SNP six array. It costs five thousand dollars to do a genome, um, but uh, that that gap is going to be closing very fast. Okay, so um, I think you know you've gone over uh, array hybridization probably with Paul, um, but uh, so I just wanted to show you how this manifests in terms of uh, uh, of um, in the copy number space. So you've looked at this in expression space, and this is how it looks in the copy number space. Um, so so here you have um, a chromosome that's been. This is low resolution. This is a, a back array technology. Um, we have uh, a diploid region here where you have relative to some control, uh, you have very little change, so the, the data points are clustered around uh, zero. And each, each data point here represents um, the hybridization intensity of, of the, the sample over the control. And, and then here you have a region where essentially you have a loss, and, uh, and that gets uh, manifest as a negative number in terms of the ratio. Um, in terms of the log ratio. So any data points above the zero line are gains, uh, neutrals are a cluster around zero, and then losses uh, are, are represented by negative numbers. Um, yeah, so, so this is essentially what um, each data point represents. Okay, so it's the copy number of a particular data point, a particular probe uh, here, I'm just calling it a clone. Uh, on a particular chromosome over the reference um, or, the, or the normal control. 
So, so the high density genotyping arrays brought us to um, uh, to, to more than one million uh, positions, and um, and and the the key uh, the key advance here as well is that um, we this technology allowed us to measure major and minor alleles uh, separately, and and that's really a key distinction between uh, the SNP arrays and and array CGH, and uh, so. So with array CGH, you could not measure copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, for example, because all you would see is that it's copy neutral. The loss of heterozygosity part, you couldn't measure because you weren't measuring individual uh, alleles. And so that was the big advance with the uh, genotyping technology. The original motivation for this was uh, genome-wide association studies and, uh, and for, for inherited SNPs that associated with human disease. And, uh, and this really, uh, this was a, a, a massive activity in, uh, in the previous decade um, where uh, literally um, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of patients were profiled using these technologies. Um, and, uh, and, and I think to some extent the progress was made uh, in terms of understanding the inherited basis of, of disease. Um, so this was the original design, but then it quickly became apparent that this could be applied in cancer as well to look at um, uh, regions of, of copy number uh, gain and loss and loss of heterozygosity. And so, uh, so, so all this analysis um, is, is readily um, amenable to, uh, to cancer-based studies. So I just wanted to spend a bit of time, I'm sure you may have um, talked about this already, but um, I, I don't think this can be overstated. Uh, the, a lot of the technology that, um, that, that we bring to bear on, in cancer samples has been developed with normal genomes in mind. So genome-wide association studies, you expect essentially most of the genome to be diploid. Um, uh, Sequencing-based studies um, basically generated from uh, a lot of the tools that, that have been generated are, uh, are from the Thousand Genomes Project, um, where the assumption is that you have essentially one sample that you're looking at, and it's it's quiescent, it's normal. Um, all the genomes of all the cells that have given rise to that DNA pool are, are homogeneous. Well, that's just not the case in cancer, um, and and because in our in our cancer samples, the pool of DNA has significant normal contamination. It's often impossible to isolate uh, cancer cells uh, exclusively. And so this will result in dilution of tumor-specific signals. And we have what's called intratumoral heterogeneity or clonal heterogeneity. And, that's, and, and generally speaking, uh, tumors are made up of clonal populations of cells with different genomes. Um, and you can imagine how, uh, so essentially what you're sequencing is you're sequencing a mixture of cells that have different genomes. And so you're getting one signal uh, that's aggregated from a heterogeneous mixture. Um, and, and really, most experimental designs um, consist of uh, a single sample from a tumor or an aggregate sample from a pool of DNA. And so, um, so we have to just bear this in mind that this is, um, this is a difficult problem. Uh, the signals uh, that are generated from somatic changes um, are generally uh, quite distinct from germ germline polymorphisms. Um, and that's because germline polymorphisms will be present in every cell um, in the sample, uh, whereas uh, somatic aberrations will, uh, will, will be manifest only in the tumor cells. And then we have the issue of uh, sometimes we have uh, genome-wide duplications or uh, polyploidy in, in our tumor cells that we have maybe three copies of the whole genome or four copies of the whole genome. <laughs> Um, that, uh, that are manifest in these tumor cells. So, so all of these issues, and, and, and actually probably others, um, uh, actually are what give rise to the measurement that we observe. And um, we tend to actually just gloss over this stuff and ignore this stuff. And so everything that you do is essentially an approximation that ignores most of this stuff. So we have to bear that in mind, okay? So in all the analysis that you're going to do even in the lab today, um, uh, you're ignoring all of these facts that we know to be true. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, so basically, I mean, I think the point here is that 
Um, the specialized tools for cancer, analytic tools for cancer, are, are, are underrepresented, are badly needed, and, uh, and, and so um, generally what people do is they take what's available and try to apply it, but it's a bit like taking a hammer to a screw. Okay, so um, there's a nice uh, review of statistical considerations for, uh, for high-density nucleotide polymorphism arrays in this paper here. Um, it's a book chapter, I think, or a handbook. Uh, it's a very nice review of, of some of the issues, and I recommend you read it. This is generally speaking the workflow for how we analyze uh, high-density genotyping arrays. Um, the first, uh, and this is really with affymetrics. Um, so if you take affymetrics uh, uh, coming off the machine, you get a file called the cell file, um, and that represents all the measurements of the the two um, major and minor SNPs, and then um, they're actually, half the probes are just for C and B, so they don't have major and minor SNPs, they just have total copy number. Um, and, and so what we do is we, we do the following. So we, there's some pre-processing normalization. Um, just due to time, I don't think we're gonna go into that in detail in the lab, um, but, but you need to know that this is an important step. Um, then what we do is we do total copy number extraction, we do the B allele extraction, and then we do what's called segmentation. Um, so we look for, uh, for breakpoints in the, in the data, and I'll show that in detail. Uh, and we look for um, loss of heterozygosity and allele-specific copy number changes, which, um, which is what I showed uh, earlier. And then, um, and then what we want to do is try to consolidate all this data and try to make sense of it in terms of genes and pathways and clinical correlations. So, so that's probably a workflow that you may have seen before. How many people have done something like this or want to do something like this with, with the data set? Okay. Okay, good. Okay. So let's just look at the specifics of Affymetrix SNP6. Um, so the probes here are 25 mer olig oligonucleotide probes. Um, there are about 900,000 SNP probes. 900,000 CMV probes, um, and what we get out of this is essentially hybridization intensity. So, so, uh, uh, so how much of um, of the probe lights up, um, and the, the the intensity of that lighting up represents, in some proportion, how much DNA is at that particular locus. Um, this may be, uh, hopefully, this link is still active. Um, if it's not, you can probably just Google what the chip definition file. This has all the gory details of, of the platform that you could ever want. Yeah. What's the difference between SNP probes and CMV probes? So the SNP probes have the major and minor alleles. The CMV probes just look at total copy number. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Why 900? Uh, well, so, so it's just to add to the resolution. So, so they're these 900 SNP probes are really optimized for um, super unambiguous, very specific SNPs that um, you know would result in minimal um, cross hybridization problems, and um, and then there are similar regions in the in the genome that um, uh, don't have SNPs but are are good for copy number analysis. So um, so that that's why. So it's just essentially to pad the data. Yeah 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 okay. Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, Gavin, do you know how many genes are represented? Most of them, right? We get measurements for most of them. Yeah, but it's not e evenly distributed. No, um, so, so actually, there are some regions of the genome um, that are just repetitive. Uh, well, a lot of the genome is repetitive, but um, some they're they're kind of holes in the in the design here. So, the parts of the genome that are just not represented at all. And if there are genes in there, then they they won't be represented. Okay. So, what's the resolution of this compared to a platform like Yeah, so so generally, I think um, 
I think Agilent has, uh, actually, I'm, I'm really not sure about Agilent. Um, Illumina has a 1M, 1 million. Um, does anybody know the resolution of the latest Agilent? Six teamers, yeah. yeah. But how many? How many probes? I think uh, uh, one uh, one million. One million, yeah, yeah. So I think SNP six is the most dense mm -hmm. um, because of the CMB probes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Right. You can also do custom. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, these, I mean, the, the, the reproducibility of these arrays is really astonishingly good. Um, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to hold questions to the end, I think, okay? So um, we've got a lot of material to get through in 20 minutes. So um, general preprocessing. So normalization is definitely required to induce uh, platform-induced artifacts, okay? So, um, so what we use uh, in our lab is uh, aroma.f matrix. And we use a, a version, uh, uh, a method called CRMA uh, version two. Um, this, generally speaking, uh, in our hands, outperforms commercial software. It's transparent. It's open source. You know what they're doing. Um, you have the code. You can even manipulate it if you want. You can ask questions. It's all, uh, it's all good. Um, and uh, and so I would strongly recommend that if you're using AFI SNP six, that you become familiar with this package. Um, what it outputs is allele specific and total copy number real value data. So one of the issues that happens is um, we get what's called uh, allele crosstalk. Um, and what that is is, is when you have uh, the major allele or the minor allele mishybridizes to the, to the other and vice versa. And, and so what this shows is how uh, is the correction of that. So here's the, the, the major and the minor. Um, and what you should see is you should see these uh, essentially the density of these um, these signals should be really vertical uh, or horizontal, um, and so if you are off of the, those axes, that means that there's cross hybridization. So it means that um, if you're probing for for the minor, then then the major is what's sticking there, and vice versa. And you can imagine there's only a single nucleotide change in a twenty in a in a twenty five mer, so it'd be easy to get crosstalk, and, and this does happen. But uh, uh, there are methods to, to correct for that. And so that, so after normalization, this is what that looks like. Um, there, are other, uh, there are other issues um, in terms of uh, GC content. Uh, and, and actually, the digestion of the DNA through re restriction fragment length yields different um, uh, hybridization intensities. So these are just properties of the genome that uh, yield variation. And, and that's not desirable, right? So what we want is all our variation should be should be contained within the biological signal that we're trying to measure. That we, we don't want the signal to be uh, to be to be diluted or confounded by by other properties of, of the genome. And so uh, so there are normalization techniques to adjust for these. Uh, and and then here's just a density plot of what all the probes look like, um, where uh, th this is the log log intensity here, um, and this is just the sort of like a histogram value, if you will. Um, before intensity, you can see that this is basically the same. Um, uh, this is like a population of HapMap individuals, so these are all diploid uh, normal individuals. And in order for them to be comparable, you want them to actually to have the same shape in their histogram. And so this is what it looks like before normalization, and this is what it looks like after normalization. So these are much more comparable to each other uh, than, than here. I'm sure Paul went over this with, my, with uh, expression arrays as well. So, so let's talk about how we infer uh, genomic features. So what we're interested in doing is, is finding total copy number. We're interested in loss of heterozygosity and allele-specific copy number alterations. Um, so just by way of notation, uh, so we let um, <clears throat> Y, A, J uh, be the intensity of the A allele at, at a given position. And then we'll let YBJ be the intensity of allele B at a given position. <coughs> and then we have the total intensities, just the sum of those. 
and, uh, and and then we look at uh, you know, with some normalization content uh, constant, we look at the total copy number at, at a given position um, is given by the total intensity over the uh, the total intensity of the reference um, normalized by some value. And uh, and then finally we have the B allele fraction. This is important. So this is the this is basically the the B allele intensity over the uh, the total intensity. Okay, so those are just terms that we'll use going forward. Okay, so so from single signal processing to to copy number. So so we did all that, and let's say we get some sort of um, we get some sort of representation of uh, of the total copy number for every position. So what do we do after that? Uh, so, so here's just an example of uh, of a tumor and a match normal, um, and 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 this is uh, this is work from Gavin, and um, and so so what we have here is uh, shown on the bottom is is what the copy number total copy number of the match normal looks like, okay, and then we have up here we have uh, this is the profile of the tumor, and um, and so you can see that there are significant. Uh, significant changes there that are present in the tumor. It's not present in the normal. Um, here we have a deletion. Here we have an amplification shown in red. Um, and then one thing to just watch out for is um, uh, looking at this in the context of the normal is very important. So here what we have is we have um, uh, what's called a copy number polymorphism or a, or a copy number germline copy number variation. This is a region of the genome that um, is obviously probed um, because uh, in, in the general population, this, this um, part of the genome should be present. But in this individual, it's just, it's just not there. And, and that's just due to inherited variation. Um, and you can see that that's manifest, uh, it's present in the tumor uh, sample as well. And that's important because if we were to not look, if we, if we didn't have this, if we didn't have the match normal, and we looked at this signal, we would say, holy cow, that looks like a homozygous deletion. Um, I wonder what gene is there, and then do all kinds of follow-up experiments and make mouse models and look at the function and say, uh-oh, it didn't do anything. So, uh, so that's not good, and we want to avoid that. So, so trying to find these, uh, these signals is, is extremely important because we don't want to be distracted by these. And so Gavin's done um, some interesting work in trying to actually, just from a tumor sample, try to distinguish these germline polymorphisms from, uh, from the somatic changes that we're interested in. Um, I think we're going to hold questions because we're really running behind. Um, but you can ask me after, just note there. Um, okay, so, so now we can think about uh, allelic imbalance, and I've already gone over this with sequencing data, but here's just some examples from SNP6 data um, where, where we have uh, very clear signals um, where we have uh, loss of heterozygosity going on here, and, uh, and uh, it in both these regions here. Okay, so so this is what it looks like when you have a diploid region. You have these kind of three bands that represent um, homozygous major, homozygous minor, and and heterozygous. And and basically, uh, in in regions where you have loss of heterozygosity, you lose this um, nice heterozygous band, and you get shifting away. So these are the, really the signals that we're trying to to capture. So, um, okay, so some approaches that you will, um, that you will encounter uh, are really kind of some different algorithmic paradigms for this. Um, you can do smoothing, uh, which is essentially is to try to fit a smooth curve to the data to try to get rid of some of the noise that's inherent in each of, in each of the samples. Um, we can do what's called segmentation. Um, we can employ uh, mixture models and uh, uh, I won't dwell on this because this is really kind of doesn't work very well. Um, and uh, and then we can use what's called a hidden Markov model approach. Um, and and this is really kind of um, uh, established as as the the gold standard in terms of uh, algorithmic and statistical modeling in the field. Um, it's the, the, this paradigm is very amenable. Uh, the, this data set data is very amenable to being processed with hidden Markov models. So there's a couple of nice um, review papers on Array CGH um, that, that cover some of this that I've listed here. So let's just look at the algorithms, um, two of the main algorithms in detail. Uh, so, so a non-parametric approach 
um, uh, where essentially there are almost no free parameters uh, in this in this approach, which is really quite attractive, um, it is called DNA copy. And uh, this really comes from um, the work of Adam Olshin. And, uh, and so uh, he first published this algorithm uh, way back in 2004. Um, and there are some nice R packages that, um, that uh, uh, you can work with. And, and it's readily um, usable on SNP6 data. Um, in, in, in my work, uh, we have an approach called HMM dosage. And it's really an extension of, uh, that works with SNP6 data. And it's an extension of original algorithm I published in 2006. Um, and this is also re readily available. And are, are they using this in the lab today, Kevin? Or? No, OK, so they're not using this one. OK, that's, that's fine. Um, but there's a, there's a modified, yet another modified version that, um, that we adapted for sequencing data um, that you will use in the lab today. OK, so, uh, so just briefly, um, this, uh, the DNA copy algorithm uh, from Olshin et al., uh, essentially what it tries to do is it outputs change points in the data. So you can see, if you look across this, this data set, and sorry, it's kind of blurry and noisy, but, but essentially, you know, it's really quite easy to see with the human eye that if you scan across here, uh, at some point there's really an abrupt change in terms of the, the intensity of, of the data here. And, and that's what we call a change point or a break point. And, and so from an algorithmic perspective, what we're really trying to do is we want to try to find these breakpoints that signify these abrupt changes in the data. And conceptually, really, that's all you need to know. Um, the computer scientists in the room you know, might want to ask me more about that, but, but that, that's, the, that's the real concept. Where, does, where along my chromosome does the data intensity change um, abruptly? Because that signifies a copy number change. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and the the key concepts here is that uh, we want to minimize uh, the win within segment variation, and we want to maximize the between segment variation. So the, if you think about the mean of this segment, we want to make sure that that is uh, as far away as possible as the mean of this segment. And then the variation, the standard deviation within this segment should be as small as possible. And likewise here. So you can imagine that if you had this whole segment here, if you, if, you, if you consider this whole region, the standard deviation would be quite high because there's a lot of variation between the probes in this segment and this segment. But if you treat them as separate segments, then um, <coughs> the standard deviation within the segment uh, is minimized. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm actually not going to go into the details of this because I don't have time. Um, but uh, to contrast that, um, the concept of a hidden Markov model is that um, the segmentation is important, but the, 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 um, that requires some downstream interpretation. So, so if you can find the DNA copy algorithm, you can find the breakpoints, but that's all you can find. So you don't know whether the segment is a, actually a copy number gain or loss, or you know how much of it how much of it is gained, and and if it's only a small gain, is it actually a gain, or is it actually just you know some some subtle variation in the in the data stream? And so that's where um, uh, hidden Markov models come in because what they do is simultaneously segment and classify the segments. So and in this in this paradigm, and I think the main concepts again, I want to make sure it's clear is that. The segmentation in this case helps with the classification and, and vice versa. Okay, so, um, and so it's really done in an iterative phase where we segment, then we classify, then we segment and classify, and, and, and we learn what characteristics of the data yield um, better classifications at each iteration. And so we use a, a, a framework called expectation maximization to do that. Um, and, and essentially we can assign semantic meaning to the states. And this is the real, this is the real uh, advantage here, is that the output actually has these, these semantic meanings. So we have um, regions of loss, regions that are neutral, and regions of gain. Uh, and so, and, and, and the, other, the other advantage is that this is a probabilistic framework such that we can get the probability that each probe is a loss, neutral, or gain, or ex even ex extend, expand the state space so that we have um, homozygous loss, hemizygous loss, neutral gain, and then maybe high-level amplification. Okay. So um, there's a lot of literature 
out there, a lot of tools that have been developed over the last, uh, I would say, 10 years now, or eight years really, um, that uh, have really evolved and advanced uh, how we think about hidden Markov models in the, in the, in the uh, context of looking at copy number changes. And, and I've just listed some of them, some of them here. In that paper from uh, Terry Speed, I actually uh, uh, I've included this, a summary of some of the changes um, and some of the methods that, that um, are employed for, uh, for the methods. And you can see that it's really dominated by, by hidden Markov models. Um, this is really kind of the way that, that um, the field is, is going. Okay, so I think I'm just going to skip over this stuff. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do in the lab is you know, once we've, let's say we've got our data set, um, you've worked hard, you've accrued the samples that you've, that you, you know, really precious materials, you, you've, you've run the assays on, on, on your precious material, you've run an algorithm to actually segment it, uh, then what do you do? Um, uh, well, so, so one, one way, and I, I think it's very, very important, is you, know, you always want to visualize your data. You always want to try to plot and look at and browse and, and get a feel for your data. Um, it was, uh, I was renovating my, my house once, and I, was, uh, uh, I had this guy come, and uh, he was this kind of old retired teacher, and he was just a very, a very good, um, wise gentleman, and he was doing all the work, and I was being his lackey. And uh, so we were fixing the walls and, you know, putting putty in the walls where all the, the stuff was. And so, so then we were sanding it down. He says, okay, well, when you're done, just you know, run your hand over the wall. Just, just close your eyes and just do this with, the, with, the, with your hands. And you'll find the places that are, that are imperfect. And, and this, is, this is what you do. This is like browsing data. You get your hands on the data. You look at it and you find out things about it. Um, and this is essential. This is really important. So, so think about renovations and painting walls when you got your data set. And, and this is what you do. So, so um, this is uh, what the Irby 2 Amplicon looks like in IGB in a thousand cases. So you pull your, your thousand cases into data, into your uh, browser, and uh, you type your coordinates into the the IGB browser, and uh, and you see that there is a lot of red around the Urbici locus, and uh, so what red means here is is high levels of copy number gain, um, and so so you know you can spend time and you can just go through each chromosome, you can look for regions of red, or you can look for regions of blue um, uh, that uh, represent deletions, and that gives you just sort of an intuitive feel uh, for what what may be present in the data. This is the RB locus, uh, where we have some very focal uh, homozygous deletions uh, uh, affecting the RB locus. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I'll just talk briefly about um, some new, some, some more advanced topics. So analysis of next generation sequencing data, and this is really still in development. We, we, we've actually, I mean, I've, we've matured our code, our code base um, uh, with respect to this, and I think it works well enough in our hands now that we've even published some, some important results um, using uh, a set of tools that we've developed. Um, and, uh, and we're working on just publishing this method, but, but it's still, still rel relatively uh, in development. But a couple of things that we've no we and others have noticed is that there's an extreme bias when um, doing copy number analysis and sequencing data that is correlated to GC content. That's because in the data generation process, there is a PCR step, and PCR is, um, is, is definitely uh, has its biases with respect to GC. And the other thing that we notice is that uh, there's, there's uh, a, essentially a bias with respect to um, repetitive and non-repetitive regions in the genome. And when you align the reads to certain parts of the genome, you'll get um, what look like amplifications or deletions um, depending on, on how mappable it is. So in the, if you look at this, um, so this is what, looks, what it looks like. Um, if you look at, uh, if you bin the data and you try to just assess, uh, you know, what, what, what is my coverage um, in a given 1 kb window, you might get a mess that looks something like this. And if you account for uh, GC content, um, it starts to get cleaned up a little bit. It looks something like this. 
If you account for mappability, then uh, it starts to become very clear what's going on. So you go from this um, very soupy mess to this very kind of clear representation. And, um, and then you can take uh, that kind of pre-processed uh, data and then run it through an HMM and segment it and, and get your um, copy number states. And, and you'll be doing this in the lab. Uh, and this is a tool called HMM Copy. Um, so we can also look at allele-specific changes in, in next-gen sequencing data. Um, we can try to account for normal contamination and ultimately, hopefully, account for intratumoral heterogeneity. Um, Gavin, uh, Gavin and I recently uh, published a paper in Genome Research um, that essentially tries to do uh, 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 the analysis of um, allele-specific events uh, in, in NGS data, and, and this is from, from his paper. Uh, and, and basically, this is um, what we showed is that this is the results of doing that analysis uh, from an array, um, in, and this is a tumor sample that we profiled with an array, uh, and this is the result we get from um, taking that same tumor sample uh, and, and, and using the sequence data that we generated to, to try to analyze it. So, so blue here represents copy neutral LOH regions, green represents deletion induced L, uh, LOH regions, and red represents allele specific copy number changes. And you can see that we re recapitulate what's found in the array quite nicely. Um, and and uh, so, so we'll go over, um, I think you're doing Apollo in the lab too, right? Okay, so this is a tool called Apollo. Okay, so I just want to finish now with a couple of um, really advanced topics. So, so what's, uh, I guess this earlier uh, last year, um, the first observation of uh, something called uh, chromothripsis was, um, was published uh, by Peter Campbell and, and Mike Stratton in Cell. And what they noticed is that um, they found this crazy pattern of um, what's called chromosome shattering and followed by a non-homologous end joining. And so, uh, so what it creates is this um, incredibly complex chromosome that has been uh, where you have loss and gains of genetic material in a, in a very kind of sawtooth pattern and then all kinds of rearrangements as well. So it's like taking a jigsaw puzzle, smashing it to the ground and then putting it back together in, a, in, in the reverse order or in some other order. Um, and, and so this was uh, this is is it was was being um, touted as kind of a, a mutational process or, or a way by which um, cancers uh, obtain abnormal karyotypes, and and it really kind of gained uh, prominence um, with with the publication of uh, a, a, in, in a, of a neuroblastoma study that looked at um, whether uh, they, they, this this group observed that chromothripsis is quite prevalent in neuroblastoma, and um, and then. Uh, really found that there was a strong association with, um, with outcomes. So patients that exhibited chromothripsis had a very severe prognosis and, and didn't do well at all, uh, whereas those that had no evidence of chromothripsis um, uh, seemed to, 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 to um, be, be much better off. Um, and so, so this has a prognostic effect in, um, in some cancer types. So the last topic I just wanted to touch on is uh, intratumoral heterogeneity. So this paper was published last year in Nature, uh, Navin et al. It's from Mike Wiggler's group. And what they basically showed is, um, is, is looking at in copy number profiles in single cells from, uh, from, a particular t from one tumor um, can exhibit really heterogeneous copy number profiles. Um, and so, so this, this idea that we're taking a single tumor sample running it through um, some sort of uh, array platform or sequencing platform um, and, and, and coming up with one profile for that tumor is probably very much erroneous. Like that's just a, a concept that um, we'll probably uh, we'll have to get past. I mean, it's, it's, it's what we can do, uh, generally speaking. Not everyone can do this single cell analysis. Maybe a couple labs can, that's about it. Um, and it's ex very expensive. So you can imagine that if you do 100 profiles, uh, for each tumor, um, now all of a sudden the cost of your study is uh, is two orders of magnitude higher than it was before, um, and so so this this is important, um, and uh, but maybe maybe impractical, but uh, but but we must consider that this is the case, and when we're dealing with a population of uh, when we're doing it, when we're dealing with a tumor sample, we're dealing with mixed populations of cells. 
Okay. So, my last summary slide. So the genome architecture is, is, is really a fundamental and important aspect of studying the cancer genome. Um, somatic copy number alterations change genes, gene dosage and can drive expression of oncogenes and tumor suppressors. Copy number alterations can be measured using array-based hybridization or next-gen sequencing. And um, really, uh, you all know this, uh, but properties of the genome revealed through copy number profiles can indicate important phenotypic characteristics of cancers. And so they're an extremely important part of the genomic landscape. And uh, any study that um, involves the genomics of, of tumors uh, must consider the genomic architecture as defined by copy number changes. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>